Good morning for everyone here at Salisbury University and good evening for everyone at Pandit Dindial Petroleum University. Welcome to the closing panel for the course CAST in the India in the US, during which students from Salisbury University and Pandit Dindial Petroleum University read Isabel Wilkerson's book CAST, The Origins of Our Discontents, and participated in some of the most engaged, thoughtful, and informed discussions we have seen about themes from the book about how they apply in both our contexts. I'm Dr. Michelle Schleoffer, one of the co-instructors of the course. We would like to thank doc Dr. Martin Paraboom, Dean of the Fulton School of Liberal Arts at Salisbury University, and Dr. Ritu Sharma, Dean of the School of Liberal Studies at P Pandit Dindial Petroleum University for their hard work in forming our cross-institutional collaboration and supporting this course. We would also like to acknowledge Salisbury University President, Dr. Chuck White, who is an, a special attendee at today's panel. Good morning, I'm Dr. Rachel Steele and I'm the other co-instructor of this course. We have all learned a lot through this collaboration and are pleased to host this closing session today. We will be hearing from experts from both uh, SU and PDPU representing a variety of disciplinary backgrounds who have read Wilkerson's book and will share their analysis and insights with us today. Each of the panelists will give an eight to 10 minute presentation of Wilkerson's work through their disciplinary lens. Attendees are welcome to submit questions to the panelists via the chat, um, either during the presentations or at the end. At the end of the presentations, we will reserve some time for the panelists to answer the submitted questions. Um, so please note that this panel is also being recorded and we will make that available later for viewing. So we'd first like to introduce Dr. James King, Professor of English at Salisbury University. Prior to joining SU in 2007, Dr. T King taught at SUNY and CUNY Systems in New York, as well as a private college, Bard College at Simons Rock. Dr. King's distinguished honors include a Fulbright Scholarship, Ghana 2010, Fulbright Hayes recipient 2015, a Monicum Ghana, and a senior lecturer, University of Ghana, Ligon. Dr. King received his undergraduate degree from Ball State University, master's degree from Queens College, and PhD from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Dr. King specializes in 20th century African-American literature and the literature of slavery. So thank you, Dr. King, for being here to share with us. Thank you for having me. I am trying to start my video. There we go. Thank you for having me. And um, I really appreciate being a part of this uh, closing panel. Um, Shall I start or, or, or are there other introductions that, that, you, that you would choose to make? No, nope, the floor is yours. Okay, All right. thank you. Um, I was looking at a document that described um, our author's book as something of a continuation of her previous award-winning text, The Warmth of Other Suns. Um, and a conclusion that many have stepped away from that previous text with is that the racism, the type of racialized treatment um, that is experienced by, not exclusively, but experienced by people of color and will be the focus of my uh, words today, that it's somewhat ubiquitous, that it, it, it almost cannot be escaped. Um, earlier this morning, um, trying to prepare uh, and just thinking about things in general. While I'm not a fan of this young man, I was reminded of the, the words of Kanye West from the Dropout album. Um, I can't specify the song right now, but the phrase goes, even if you're in a Benz, as in Mercedes Benz, and then there's a phrase that, com that completes that. Um, which is just still a nigger. Um, if the warmth of other sons suggests that, that American racism is ubiquitous, then this text 
I think is trying to probe as to the why for that all pervasive nature that that the inescapability of it and and by going into the history and sort of doing a a, a forensic interpretation of racialized thought and finding those those points of connectivity sadly with the nazi regime within uh germany in, in the 20th century and um, um Indian culture on that continent um, related to caste. So now we're getting we're getting an understanding as to as to the why. Um, the question I would then have is now what? That's that's the frustrating question for me. I'm reminded of James Baldwin when he when he uh, was interviewed. I think it was in 1960, and he was talking to an interviewer, and he said, um, "You know, it's taken my mother's time, my father's time, my sister, my brother's time, my nieces, my nephews' time. How long do you expect me to wait for your so-called progress?" And I was listening to something on the news a few days ago and, and one of our um, representatives at the university in student life was on television and he was discussing over the phone the need for these important conversations that phrase has almost been worn out the question of important conversations the i If I could get everybody to, to Google Richard Pryor's uh, album, Bicentennial Nigger, and take a look at the sermon, the question is, how long will this bullshit go on? And it's this rhetorical question that Pryor asked way back in 1976 or in that, within that time frame. And yet the question, we're still asking the same question today. Um, how many, how many ways do we need to have this confirmed with Gunnar Myrdal nailing this in 1944 in the American Dilemma, talking about the indeterminacy of the treatment that people of color can expect at the hands of members of the dominant culture by his observation during that time period. You've got Du Bois looking into this, you know, on a, on a granular level in, in the souls of black folk in 03. And, and working forward from there to the 1946-45 conference in uh, Manchester, trying to come up with language to articulate that notion, that difference of race. And in the very next year, glancing off the word caste, using the word caste um, by his claim for the first time within that context. Um, you've got Richard Wright and, and Ralph Ellison talking throughout their literary careers and careers as public intellectuals about the phenomenon of beating that boy, which was their comment, their phrase for the race problem, for discussing race, in part because it's, it, it's an ongoing thing, but also because people are so tired of hearing about it. I was looking at some of the reviews and some of the critiques of our author's text, and quite often people would, would, would challenge the fact that she persists in pointing out via anecdote and, and explicit detail actual events. What do we do with the fact that, that, that the community that's, that needs to be reached, the folks that, that need to get woke, if I can step into that realm, don't want to hear it anymore? It's like the group that we're, we're living post Richard Wright's native son. Post all the self-flagellation that the, that, that the liberal left gave itself when that book finally was published, but it only lasted for so long. It, like the Black Lives Matters paintings that are on streets all over our wonderful country, are now being painted over again. Basketball courts are being re re returned to their regular wood luster. And so when do we stop talking about these things? We have an, an, an unsurmountable amount of evidence that it occurs, this racism, this racialized treatment. When do we stop talking about it? And when do we start doing things that are commensurate with the word action?
Thank you, Dr. King. We'd like to next introduce Dr. Nita Karana, senior faculty in the Department of, Lecture, of Language, Literature and Aesthetics at Pandindial Petroleum University. Having served the gov government of Gujarat for 15 years, she has been working at PDPU since 2010. She has lectured and published extensively on gender, semiotics, communication skills, and has coordinated with over 500 village kids under the Community Development Initiative of PDPU. She is the principal coordinator of two internship programs at PDPU and coordinates with over 200 NGOs every year, along with over 1,000 students as interns. She is, she is a published author and recently published her own autobiography. She was awarded the ninth Boston Green Fest Award for her work with over 2,000 people living in urban low-income areas and her contribution towards a more sustainable future through education and research. Dr. Karana. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to have, uh, you know, uh, be able to uh, be part of the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, and congratulations, Michelle and Rachel, Dr. Sharma, for this excellent uh, initiative. And I totally love the fact that you had one focused book and then, you know, you've made the students go through it. And I am totally in agreement with the um, my previous panelist, uh, Dr. James, when he says that action needs to be taken. So uh, when I got the hold of uh, this book in my hand, I thought it was written by a woman. It was about caste, and therefore there would be a lot of gendered uh, you know, reading of this. But unfortunately, when I went through it, I, um, I was supposed to speak on gender, but I don't think there is much of an obvious gendered reading in this particular text. I can bluff my way through by you know, putting uh, in um, Butler theory of Butler's performativity or Ellen Walter's theory, you know, or, you know, uh, just take it uh, to critical studies of men and masculinities and talk about it. But then uh, the concern that I've had with Wilkerson is uh, why, why did she name the book Cast? You know, uh, like I said, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, James didn't want to use the word, you know, he used racism. No, so it could have been racism, it could have been discrimination, it could have been uh, oppression, it could be at multiple levels. But um, having said that, uh, I'm massively fascinated by the reading of the text and uh, um, I would, uh, I love the way that uh, this, the, the narrative has evolved in this particular um, text. And uh, I would want to go to the text for and foremost, and then uh, when I'm talking about the critique, I would talk about examples from the work that I do with the poorest of the poor, the Dalits, the underprivileged, even the subhumans as they're called, and how actually the real life situation could be slightly different from what is uh, you know portrayed. And uh, things do change, you know, that is one hope I can share with uh, Dr. Jane, that action does take place if one needs to. And those are a few stories that I will change. And I will run through very fast because I feel that uh, 10 minutes or so seven to 10 minutes is too less a time with the number of uh, you know flags that I've put on the book, uh, but maybe later I'll share a detailed uh, critique that I've written uh, with you all. Uh, now, uh, before anything else, uh, I would want to bring in the three remarkable, um, you know, uh, things about caste uh, that I see in this particular book, you know, since I, since I understand and appreciate and teach poetry, I must say that Ms. Wilkerson's book is partly more persuasive because of her rich style and poetic allegories that she copiously employs in almost every chapter. And she has attempted to, without any indignation, situate the evolution of the racial history of USA within the ambits of the larger context of caste. Uh, and she has also succeeded in fulfilling one of my latent fantasies by ma marrying 20th century's most popular icons in Martin Luther King Jr., Du Bois, and Dr. Ambaker. And her epithet of American touchable for Martin Luther King seemed to be rather compelling. And Dr. Ambaker is also referred to as, quote unquote, the patron saint of the low born of India, which is fascinating. Now, uh, when I look, uh, when I read through the book, like instead of going through the tropes of her argument, I will enlist a few segments from her book uh, that give us some idea of her narrative to just to uh, situate the text. Um, Point number one, that uh, the year 2022 marks the first year that United States will have been an independent nation for as long as slavery lasted on its soil, which means to say that we have suffered for ever so long. Uh, then no one was quote unquote white before he, she came to America, which again goes on to mean to say that the plundering invasions uh, by the Europeans led to the sudden discovery of their uh, superiority. Um, then of course, uh, another point that she makes in her book is uh, becoming white meant uh, defining themselves as furthest uh, from its opposite black. 
and uh, uh, next point that goes on is that it was in the making of the new world that Europeans became white Africans or uh, black and everyone else yellow, red or brown, you know, so the, the, the racial part of it, you know, the color uh, coding, so as to say, in the society uh, that happened. And then, of course, um, the fact that uh, uh, it, they, there emerged a ladder of humanity uh, which was global in nature as the upper rung people would descend from Europe with rungs inside uh, the designations and the English uh, Protestants being at the very top, you know, meaning to say uh, that it was an idea emerging from the narrative of uh, Eurocentricism. Now, uh, the primary argument of the book, uh, so as to uh, uh, say, uh, is uh, that the single minded uh, aim of this work uh, is to show that what we mistakenly think of as race in the history of the US is in fact better thought of as caste. And that is what she is trying to establish. Now, Wilkerson's through her books wants us to see America's uh, enduring resistance to black uh, equality through the prism of the caste system of India. And principally caste uh, as a social hierarchical system uh, is associated with India. The effects of race in America as elsewhere in the world are complicated and continuing. And she defines caste as, quote unquote, a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups on the basis of ancestry, unquote. Now, this is a complicated book uh, that does a simple thing, and which is she avoids words like white and race and racism in favor of terms like dominant caste, favored caste, upper caste and lower caste. You know, this was very fascinating. And the modern meaning of the term race with reference to humans, uh, which began to emerge in the 17th century. Now it is a caste is a subsection of uh, uh, a subsection of the chapter on race in uh, Britannica. So Miss Wilkinson uh, can neither be faulted nor applauded for being the first one to make that affinity between the two. Uh, now, when I were to uh, critique uh, this particular uh, text and, you know, talk about it uh, from a social, as a social scientist working in India, it is impossible to, like in India, it is impossible to evade the question of caste. You know, we might say that we have, uh, uh, we do not pay much attention to it, but every time the election uh, season, you know, comes up, caste is the one factor that, you know, uh, sees to it who gets the ticket to fight the election. And then the whole, be it violence, be it support, everything is, you know, uh, uh, just working around the caste system. Uh, same goes for jobs. You know, there are like, uh, she talks about uh, Indian system having reservations for uh, the underprivileged, uh, which definitely then does make a question that uh, many times it's the Brahmins who are suffering because they are not getting the, the opportunity to get into uh, that job uh, category. And the other ones then who become the sufferers. So there's, it's a very complicated scenario, but then the fact of the matter is that there are these hierarchies that, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we tend to, whenever anything new on caste comes in, we tend to, you know, scorn it or we went to we look at it uh, from a critical point of view. I felt like Tushar, whom she mentions in the book, you know, the, the gentleman whom she met in London and, and who said, like, it came to the shock that uh, does America has a caste system? You know, even I would uh, question that, uh, despite the fact that it's been multiple times that I have visited uh, the United States. And it doesn't occur to you, you know, that you don't think that there is such a hierarchy. You know that there could be racism, there could be oppression, there could be you know trouble. Uh, we see the Thirteenth Amendment, and we know the how things go. The movie is replete with the same examples that Wilkerson has given. So, and we do see uh, things here and there, but then it never occurs to it us as you know putting it under a caste. I don't know how many Americans are convinced that there is caste system in America. You know, these are things. They could be oppression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then it is fascinating to see how she has managed to weave this. Uh, a whole story and they you don't know, bring the, the writings on caste uh, in front of us. Now, um, I have always believed that the best writings are on caste are always the ones that result in discomfort and unsettling of notions. And I have, uh, like, say, for example, if you were to read the autobiographies of Dalit women, say, for example, Bama, Virama, Nalini Jamila in India, you know, they have written the autobiographies and they're the ones which are insights into how caste works actually, how Dalits function and how they are treated. And uh, so one example that I can give you as working with the uh, uh, program for IL, uh, ILO and they were talk, working with the manual scavengers. And uh, there is this woman who eventually became the um, head of the department of the Sanskrit department in uh, Delhi University, which is an extremely prestigious university. 
she was a daughter of one of the manual scavengers manual scavengers are people who who put uh, human feces or you know in a, in a in a in a in a bucket or a basket and put it on the head and throw it you know that is what they used to do in 1993 it was banned but uh, recently i found out that it is again happening in one of the villages where i went to work and she said that uh, when she was small you know uh, wilkins wilkinson is also talking about uh, color coding uh, the, the the clothes that they wear and in uh, the state of uttar pradesh uh, when we had uh, miss mayawati as chief minister who is a dalit woman and uh, her party is the dalit party and she decided to give away a blue colored cloth because the color of her party was blue to the dalit children in the schools you know so that they can get free cloth to make their uniforms but then it automatically you know, differentiated them from the other people who were wearing white clothes so this lady she did refuse to wear the blue color she said i'm not going to wear blue because this is going to make it worse for me you know, like dr james said that why do we have to rub it in you know why do we have to keep talking about it they don't want the new generation possibly doesn't want to look at it because they are evolving and she uh, said i'm not going to wear blue and the father goes and gets a white cloth and the mother sews a uniform for her and she wears it and later on she came to know that that was the cloth which was taken stolen by her father from one of the cops which was lying in the ground because we cover our dead with a white cloth he took that white cloth and sewed the dress and she wore it to school and eventually that was a statement and then went on to become an expert in sanskrit literature which is a brahmanical uh, language you know the brahmins are supposed to know it you know that has always been the case and being a dalit she did that that is just one story among the millions another point is that recently i'm documenting a tribe here in gujarat who wear their sexuality on their sleeves literally these are women who wear clothes which have different colored flowers on their dresses on the tops of the blouses which represent that uh, uh, they are available for uh, uh, sexual relationship they find their partners through the representation of their sexuality on the clothes so you get to know who is a widow who is ready to you know have an affair who is ready to this and which is amazingly liberating when I, mean, i can't do that you know presently but these are dalit totally totally underprivileged below the poverty line women who are doing this you know so they are uh, in a way differentiating so a uh, caste in india is not what it used to be as wilkinson says people are reacting people are fighting back uh, so it, it is no more uh, it is no more the scenario wherein the the brahmin's father you know the boy there's a there's a story where she talks about the brahmin boy his father running away because you know the 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 laborer uh, fought back people are fighting back and they, therefore there is hope you know things are changing uh so many stories which i could share of the ground realities which are uh, hope giving us hope of change uh so this is just uh, one of it but you also have to keep in mind that this particular book uh, i mean i could be too critical of the book but then it was uh, the book is opportune which with uh, which every work of research can be like uh, uh congratulations to you that miss uh, kamla harris uh, has won the election and you know after years and years uh, she is the one who has uh, broken the Uh, the first wrong literally you know because uh, america is uh, what we look up to as an evolved developed nation and uh, uh, despite the fact uh, that you know uh, we have had women leaders uh, way ahead like uh, wilkerson also pointed out so it is it comes as a surprise as to why the delay why it took so long what were the americans doing and therefore the whole thought of you know how the whole community thinks differently so why is it that the women were not leading the way when there is so much of empathy and everything else and when they are deserving as well so um i mean i don't know i've written like uh, uh, tens and tens and thousands of words here to talk about it but just maybe i i'm just running i think 10 minutes i'll, I'll just uh, wind up uh to say that uh uh structural classification of society i mean this is like all literary technical terminology that i, I would love to share stories rather than talk uh, um, things like this but then uh, just to uh, put in so the structural classification of society bears no legal validity uh, but experience of operation in one context cannot be transposed into another because institutions like caste and race are not so yielding after all and the wilkerson's well intentioned plea of searching for similarities between the lives of dr ambedkar and martin luther king jr and groups like dalit panthers and black panthers notwithstanding it has to be understood that solidarity between the proletariat of various geographies alone does not make them similar and mutual admiration cannot be the basis for structural comparison uh, race is semiotics of pigment and caste is semantics of ill conceived purity is what we used to we need to keep in mind and lastly since her writings uh, thrive in analogical narrative i wish to make one more point even at the cost of pedantism 
uh, an analogy seeking to eliminate one thing of showing what is um, what it has in common with something else. But then again, everything is what it is and not another thing. You know, so we, we should not have the other uh, and talk about it like Simone we were, was, uh, you know, talking about the other. But um, race is uh, and is not like Indian caste. The anti-Semitism of the Nazis is and is not like American anti-Black racism. And the story of race in America as a kind of caste system uh, requires Wilkerson to tell us a great deal about caste in modern India with the Dalits as outcasts in relation to the main system of the priests, rulers, merchants, and tradesmen, while inevitably stinting on its complexity. The analogy nevertheless offers potent illumination, but uh, that is what it does uh, alone as, as far as I'm concerned. So thank you so much. Uh, I will share the transcript uh, for you to circulate with the students because there's more in detail, but I'll just wind up. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Looking forward to the question answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karana. Um, next, we welcome Dr. Aston Gonzalez, an associate professor of history at Salisbury University, specializing in African-American culture and politics during the long 19th century. Before teaching in Maryland, he completed an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellowship through the Library Company of Philadelphia's program in African-American history and a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship. His first book, Visualizing Equality, African-American Rights and Visual Culture in the 19th Century, examines how African-American activists produce images to advance campaigns for Black rights in the middle decades of the 19th century. He has forthcoming and published articles about African-American portraiture during the early Republic, picturing Black citizenship during the Civil War through creation of African-American archives and the visual representation of escaped slaves and the visual production of free Black abolitionists. So thank you, Aston, for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Steele and Schleyhofer. Um, thank you also to Deans Paraboom and Sharma for helping to organize this. And uh, I'm really excited to, to take part in this conversation because Wilkerson's book um, is masterful in the way that it synthesizes a lot of information that historians have been writing about for um, more than a hundred years at this point. And that's to say that uh, I'm really impressed by the way that she tackles this huge idea of caste, right? This overarching structure that explains some of the ways that um, Nazi Germany came to power, right? The Nazi party in Germany came to power and also how racism has evolved, how discrimination has changed over the course of the long history of the United States and even before during the colonial period. So I just wanted to um, start my my comments this morning or this, this evening for some of you by, by drawing your attention to the ways that Wilkerson identifies this psychological impulse, it seems, for humans to identify and create hierarchies. And this was one of the themes and the, the patterns and the through lines in the book that really concerned me because it seemed at many places uh, when she was writing about the, the wolf pack um, uh, analysis, for example, right? She, she wrote about the, the alpha dogs, the, the omega dogs, the betas, and, and um, this, is, right, this is something that I think is very concerning in part because she seems to identify that there's a, um, a historical continuation of these kinds of ranking and you know, established roles or alleged or implied responsibilities that an individual or a group has within a certain group or within a much larger, um, a nation perhaps. And as a historian, this is something that piqued my attention because in my research, I found that over the course of several hundreds of years in the United States and what was before um, the colonies, that this is a, an absolutely critical, it's an absolutely foundational understanding of how people relate to one another. And we see that even when the colonists, right, whether they be French or Dutch or Spanish, or British, they come to uh, North America, they establish these 
uh, these ideas that they've brought over with them and they mix um, these ideas and these theories with the kinds of realities that they encounter among Native Americans, right? And among the enslaved Africans that they bring from the continent of Africa. So there's a, and also the Caribbean, but we see that there's a, um, a, a problem too, in the sense that there's always resistance. Native Americans, enslaved Africans, they're constantly pushing back. And this is, as you can imagine from the title of my book and the introduction that Dr. Steele gave, this is the focus of much of my research. And I think Wilkerson doesn't tackle that as much, right? It's obvious given the subtitle of her book that she's interested more in the, the origins of caste or the ways that it plays out here in the United States and Germany and in India. But what I really think could have been covered a little bit better and a little bit more, and this speaks a little bit to what Dr. Karana was saying also, was that there are people who push back. There are movements who um, don't see, don't make it to the pages of her book who have been fighting this fight for a very, very long time. Now it's true that the overarching structures still exist, right? These are deeply problematic, deeply harmful structures of racism and prejudice in their many forms. But I think what can be uh, we, should, we should read the text with a little bit more of a critical eye to the ways that people are pushing back, right? Even when Wilkerson is sharing these stories of her in the airport, for example, or in airplanes where she's accosted by, right, the, the alleged DEA agents or the, the men in first class who, um, who basically assault her uh, in search of their overhead bags, right? That she and other people, right, constantly speak back, they take action. And I wish we had seen that a little bit more from, uh, from, from the text. I think there's, a, there's a, a sense of resistance that we're, we're missing here. And a lot of the, the actors that she, that she writes about, these historical figures, I'm thinking of the picture um, that she writes about and I think this fifth section of her book, right? This man who is brought in from, uh, from the, what's then called the Negro Leagues. He helps to integrate the major leagues, um, the major, major league baseball here in the United States in 1948, a couple of years after Jackie Robinson, right? He, he is a, he's a man who has incredible, um, he has an incredible story and an incredible athletic gift. And yet we only, she only brings him in to speak about how uh, and, and gives his gives voice to him as a way of saying, oh, this was a missed opportunity, right? But what kind of life did he lead before? What, right? what kind of life did he um, sort of partake in? Was he, was he in any way involved in trying to bring um, a greater visibility to the plight of African-Americans during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s? I have a sense that he did. Right, and I think there are lots of stories that are that are buried here in this book that that have possibility, and I, I think that's a really critical um, sort of lens to, to view the text through. I also really want to to stress Wilkerson's um, points about religion and specifically about Hinduism and Christianity that really form the foundation of how caste as an overarching structure, not just the one that plays out. In, the, in India, but how religion is a, a guiding force of these Dutch, these Spanish, these British, these French colonists who come to what is deemed by them the new world, right? Even though we know that it's not in any way new um, to the Native Americans who've lived here, who had lived here for um, tens of thousands of years. But this, this religion, this Christianity, this uh, philosophy of approaching the world as civilized, uncivilized, barbaric, or esteemed, right, is, is a way I think of her, uh, of Wilkerson, explaining the, the very sort of uh, beginnings of caste. And I wish that through line had been pulled um, into the other, the, the subsequent sections of the text, because there's a lot today that um, she could draw on. I mean, she, she describes how caste uh, evolves, right? This belief in, in Christian um, sort of philosophies 
being adopted by slave owners, for example, and using uh, language from Leviticus, right, one of the chapters in the Old Testament, to, to justify slavery, right? There's constantly this moving goalpost, I think, that uh, Wilkerson identifies, that she says, well, religion is being used in different ways over the course of the 17th, the 18th, the 19th centuries. And it would be really interesting to see her formulation for how religion is, um, is taken up in the 20th and the 21st centuries, right? If we can think about the ways that she writes about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and, um, right, that would be a, a fascinating way of her sort of, uh, sort of expanding her analysis of religion in the 20th century, for example. But I think that she is, is fantastically gifted at making sense of these much bigger issues and uh, allowing us as readers to, to understand uh, in a comparative sense how these structures, how these hierarchies form, how they take place and how they evolve. And as a historian, that's what I'm really interested in. And I hope that's what is piquing some of your interest, right? How this, how change over time takes place. And I, I wanna end by, by again, thanking everybody here and I'm looking forward to, to listening to and learning from each of you and your respective disciplinary angles. But I, I think as a historian, I wanna leave you uh, with this idea that, that Wilkerson is, is very good at understanding how these larger structures play out, right? She writes about these pillars that essentially uphold the idea of caste. And I think it behooves us, as Drs. King and Karana were saying earlier, to, to think about how these pillars are moving, right? How we, at, how we collectively as cultures, as societies, um, even as individuals we might not, but as uh, societies and as cultures, we might add to those pillars and how it is important that we try to dismantle those pillars, right? Break them down and, and make sure that they're not shifting and, and um, sort of upholding these ideas that we, that we believe to be and that we know to be are so harmful and so egregiously wrong. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. As a reminder, we just want to remind attendees that they're welcome to submit questions via the chat function and we'll re we will reserve time at the end of today's session for panelists to answer attendee questions. I'd like to introduce Professor Nagam Dave, who is the Director of the School of Liberal Studies at Pandi Dindial Petroleum University. He oversees various academic and administrative profiles at PDPU. Professor Dave has visited the United States, Canada, Singapore, Australia, and Malaysia as a member of academic and government delegations. He has been awarded the honorary rank of Colonel by NCC, NCC India. He is currently also the head of Office of International Relations, PDPU. Professor Dave received his bachelor's degree from St. Xavier's College, his master's degree and PhD from Bhavagnagar University. Professor Dave specializes in English literature, contemporary Indian fiction, and the portrayal of adolescence in fiction. Professor Dave. Thank you very much. I would, uh, I hope I'm uh, audible, visible, and the screen share is also visible. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, Good evening and good morning, depending on wherever you are. Eric Byrne once said that the moment the little boy is concerned with which is Jay and which is Sparrow, he no longer sees the bird or hears them sing. When I was making this presentation, I remembered Tom Hanks movie, Cast Away, in which the protagonist finds himself uh, stranded on an uninhabited island, metaphorically, not just the caste, but any discriminating factor that isolates a human makes one feel stranded on an uninhibited island, even when flesh and blood uh, bodies are around. The story of ancient India goes like this, that there was a monk, his name was Uddalak. He advised his son Shwet Ketu to go and explore the Brahman. The Brahman is the divine, the ultimate knowledge that one can get. The boy leapt 
the home at the age of 12 and return when he was 24. Proud and arrogant of his knowledge, uh, he came and he started talking about his knowledge and the father saw the conceit of his son and asked him whether he had acquired wisdom that separated him from the herd. When the son asked for the detailed explanation, father took him out and showed him clay, clay on the ground. And he said that just as a single lump of clay, dear boy, one would know about everything made from clay, the difference being merely a verbal distinction, a name, the reality is only at the end of the day, the clay. Father then pronounced the greatest wisdom that the Indians cherish in one liner sutra, tatvam asi, which means that which is the final essence, the whole universe is that as its soul, that is reality, that is self, and that is you, Shwet Ketu. Indian society, and for that matter, the world, has found ways to see the difference, not the essence. In ancient India, there was this occupational or behavior classification called Varna. Caste, as we know today, came with the colonization in India. The word Varna comes from the Sanskrit root word Vranoti, meaning to cover, to shield. There were four Varnas, Brahmins, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. It did not come, contrary to the current understanding, it did not come as hereditary stem. Some believe that uh, this classification was also based on three gunas. Gunas are the personality traits. Sattva, which is pious and oriented to knowledge. Rajas, which is engaged in pursuit of money. And Tamas, which encourages the animalistic instinct in the human being. And anyone, irrespective of the clan one was born in, could be known based on these traits. We find the evidence of this uh, same in epic Mahabharata, uh, during which the warrior Arjun, who is born Kshatriya of the warrior tribe, who is supposed to fight and who is action oriented, suddenly develops weakness and he starts arguing like a scholar on the battlefield instead of engaging directly into action. And uh, he starts asking his charioter and his friend and his advisor Krishna whether he should fight or not. Krishna chides him and says, Ashochwa nanva shochastvam pragnya vadanscha bhasa se gatasun agatasuncha nanu shochanti panditaha. What he says is that you are arguing like a pandit, a scholar. But had you been really the real one, you would have known that scholars don't worry about what is or what was. There is a stotra, uh, in fact, uh, entire uh, end of the Upanishad, uh, Vajras, Vajrasuchi Upanishad, which makes it elaborate and asks if one is Brahmin or a higher caste by birth, body, skin complexion, knowledge, or action. And when each of this question results in negation, the answer is found that being Brahmin, the higher caste, is to attain self-actualization. Thus, we had in mythology, Parashuram, whom you can see with the X in the picture, he was born a Brahmin who was supposed to dedicate himself to the pursuit of knowledge. But his actions were violent like a warrior. All the epistles in uh, India of uh, peace and non-violence like Mahavir and Buddha and the other Tirthankars were born as Kshatriyas, but they followed the, uh, followed the path of knowledge and wisdom. Greatest Hindu epics ever written, Ramayana and Mahabharata, both were written by what later on came to be known as the lower caste, but are held in India as the encyclopedia of knowledge. However, these arguments don't free India or the Indian society from the guilt of discrimination. In Purusha Sukta, subtly and metaphorically, the supremacy of caste is shown where it is mentioned 
that when the God Almighty or the supreme power created the universe, the Brahmins came out of the mouth and the Shudras came from the feet. Now, some try to counter this and say that uh, it might be the interpolation uh, and it doesn't mean what it literally means, but I find it to be an excuse. Even if Varna was based on the root word Vranoti, it still is a discrimination on the basis of skin color. We have both the types of stories in uh, Indian epics in which uh, there is a friendship between the higher caste and the lower caste is shown, and there is a discrimination between uh, the caste that is also shown. So Indian, in Indian epic, Ram, who is also uh, respected in Indian society, is shown respecting the untouchable woman, Shabri, and befriending with Guha, the boatman. But there is also the story in the same epic where Shambuk is killed by Ram because he was of lower caste and he was not supposed to follow the pursuit of knowledge and he did try. And that is the reason why he is killed. In uh, Mahabharat, another warrior, Karna, who is actually born as Kshatriya but had to live as the, uh, as the lower caste person is insulted on every occasion and uh, he was because he was from the lower caste and Eklabya, who is the first student of distant education in India, who actually did not meet his guru or the teacher face to face, but learned from distance is deprived of his knowledge by uh, when the guru asks him to cut his thumb so that he cannot use his knowledge of archery later on. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this injustice is done to Eklavya because he is not Kshatriya of a warrior tribe. Even in modern times, we still find matrimonial sites in India, which blatantly emphasize on either the fair skin or the higher caste. Atrocities on Dalit women are many, and the power that be shields the higher caste. The picture that you see of a burning pyre is a recent incident happened in India in Hathras when a Dalit woman was raped and the police, without giving custody of dead body of the woman to her family, the police burnt her body. Uh, there are also incidences where the Dalits uh, who uh, in wedding, as per the ritual in India, the other caste can ride the horse, but the Dalits cannot ride the horse because they are from the lower community. There have been also controversy where uh, Dalits who have kept mustache, they have been asked to remove that mustache. They have been shaved because Dalit cannot take it. Such cases come and are conveniently forgotten. Although as uh, Dr. Kurana was saying, urbanization has reduced inequality, but it is still around. And there's more that we need to do. At the same time, uh, the actions to bring Dalits at par with the mainstream to reduce the difference between the lower caste and the higher caste has resulted into two new adverse results. Those who were at the periphery now have started becoming the center and those who were at the, at the center are now facing the bias. They are facing the hostile weather. The reservation policy for jobs and promotion based on caste in India has led many meritorious people leave country. The acts to pro protect the Dalits are misused by many Dalits. Also the extreme hardliners in caste politics have coined slogans like Tilak Talaju or Talwar Inko Maro Jute Char, meaning Brahmins, Vaishya and Kshatriya, those who are supposedly from the higher caste uh, they are supposed to be and deserve to be beaten with shoes. In short, while we do introspect on past and realize the errors, it is time to take the affirmative action and understand that each one of us is a tune waiting to be expressed in symphony. Let the world be a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dabib. Um, please welcome Dr. Aaron Studelberg, Assistant Professor in the Department of Secondary and Physical Education, Seidel School of Education at Salisbury University. 
At Salisbury University, she coordinates, teaches, and supervises in the undergraduate and MAT secondary English education programs. Prior to her career in higher education, Dr. Studelberg taught middle and high school English. She earned her PhD in curriculum and instruction, critical literacy and English education from the University of Minnesota in 2016. Her scholarship engages critical white, whiteness studies and intersectional feminist theory to study literacy practices, teacher identity and teacher education. Her recent publications explore issues of race, gender, embodiment, and identity in the experiences of teachers through feminist and collective research methodologies. So thank you, Dr. Studelberg, for being here today. Thank you for the introduction and for having me as a guest in your class. I'm going to talk today about caste and education, particularly the US public education system, drawing on Wilkerson's text. Many call our education system in the United States a great equalizer that provides opportunity and access to knowledge, literacy, and cultural capital to all. When the system fails to create equality, which we see evidence of over and over again, it is then described as broken. For instance, the COVID-19 pandemic and move to virtual learning has once again illuminated inequalities in education access and opportunity for low-income students, including many Black, Indigenous, and students of color. When this evidence becomes public, there's a search for who to blame, state or federal governments, administrators, teachers unions, teachers, parents and families, even sometimes the children themselves. Over time, this cycle repeats itself. If you've grown up in the United States, you've likely heard about a crisis in education more than once in your lifetime. Recently, some education scholars have asked us to reframe our thinking about equality and education. What if, instead of schools being great equalizers, they were built as part of a caste system, as a mechanism for maintaining hierarchies of power? What if, when education perpetuates inequality, it is not actually broken, Rather, it is succeeding wildly at what it was designed to do, to oppress, discriminate, maintain white supremacy, solidify caste. This reframing of the structure and purpose of education has been a hard pill for many to swallow. Those who work in education, like myself, do not want to believe that the system they've dedicated their life to is oppressive at its roots. Those who have succeeded in the public school system, like many of us, don't want to believe that their achievement is under a shadow of systemic privilege and oppression. This can be as true for those in lower castes who have managed to achieve despite their marginalization as it is for those of the dominant caste. The myth of meritocracy in the United States complicates our ability to understand systemic racism and classism as foundational to our education system. I found that while reading the text that Wilkerson's theorizing can help us to understand this reframing of the US school system as fundamental to a caste system. Wilkerson gives us language to disentangle this critical perspective, to recognize educators role within an oppressive education system. And perhaps rather than reject or deny or get defensive about it, to open ourselves up to learn and grow through this lens. In particular, I find that three of Wilkerson's eight pillars of caste have direct connections to the historical and current day operation of the US education system. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my time today making those three connections a little more explicit um, in order to explore how schools function to uphold caste. So the first pillar um, that I wanna discuss is pillar number four, purity versus pollution. School segregation is a mainstay of our US caste system. Segregated black schools had few to no resources and black students were prohibited from enrolling in white institutions, including colleges and universities. After the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision in 1954, mandating school desegregation, white communities found ways to delay or prevent the integration of schools sometimes by completely shutting down their public school system and opening whites only private schools instead. There were several counties and districts across the country that had no public school system for many years um, 
because they did not want to integrate their schools. But the process of desegregation slowly did continue. And in 1988, school integration reached its peak in the United States. At that time, the courts began to let local jurisdictions abandon their desegregation projects. And more recent court decisions have even prohibited these racial integration projects in schools. Back under local control, schools have become increasingly segregated once again. And I don't have time today to explore all the complex reasons for why that has happened, but I'd be happy to suggest other readings and materials that you might wanna look at. Racial segregation in schools allows the dominant caste to maintain purity by protecting its children from exposure to the children of other castes and to perpetuate an unequal and lower quality system of schooling for lower caste children. The next pillar I want to discuss is pillar number five, occupational hierarchy. And this you'll see is connected to uh, pillar four in school segregation as well. Wilkerson explores the ways that the division of labor is based on one's place in the caste hierarchy. And this is certainly connected to the teaching profession. In our US school system today, 80% of public school teachers K through 12 are white. Pre-1954, when schools were racially segregated by law, there were lots of black teachers in the United States teaching at all black schools. But one consequence of desegregation in which black students were moved into white schools, but not the other way around, was the loss of black teachers from the profession. In order to preserve caste, black teachers were not hired to teach in newly integrated schools. This purposeful exclusion of black educators has endured in our system today. While teaching is not a highly paid profession in the United States, the close interaction between teachers and children, as well as the authority of the teacher in her classroom, remains reasons for the dominant caste to want non-white teachers excluded from the profession. Finally, pillar number six, dehumanization and stigma. This pillar brings us directly into the experiences of black, indigenous, and students of color in schools and classrooms today as they navigate a system that does not see them as individual children, but as groups in need of control and policing by the dominant caste. Teachers, again, overwhelmingly white, will say that they view and treat all children the same, but much evidence from the system says otherwise. Black preschoolers, that's three and four-year-old children, are suspended and expelled from school at disproportionate rates. School discipline policies around hair and dress codes are known to target black and brown students. Increased surveillance and police presence in schools, which was largely a response to school shootings in the early 2000s, have not decreased school shootings, but have increased the criminalization of black students. Black students are policed and punished more than their white counterparts, often for violations related to insubordination, a category that mostly white teachers and administrators get to define. Black students are also dehumanized daily through school curricula that centers and reaffirms the stories, histories, and value of the dominant caste. In her epilogue, Wilkerson implores us to imagine a world without caste. The system persists, she writes, because we allow it to in large and small ways in our everyday actions in how we elevate or demean, embrace or exclude on the basis of the meaning attached to people's physical traits. It is the actions and inactions of ordinary people in the case of schools, teachers, administrators, families, communities who uphold caste. Once awakened to caste, Wilkerson writes, we can become caste breakers. As, teach, as a teacher educator, this is among my primary concerns. How do we educate a generation of teachers who are able and willing to take on this role to develop what Wilkerson calls radical empathy and use it to work from within to reimagine a school system without caste? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Studelberg. To close our panel, we'd like to introduce Dr. Ritu Sharma. Dr. Sharma is the Dean of the School of Liberal Studies at Pandit Dean Dayal Petroleum University and holds a PhD in psychology. Her ongoing research projects include internationally funded study in collaboration with Edith Cohen University in Australia, 
IC SSR funded projects and projects by the government of Gujarat. She is a member of multiple professional organizations. She is also serving a doctoral committee member, consulting editor, reviewer, and an editorial board of four journals. She is professionally trained in cognitive behavior therapy and also certified as a stress management trainer. She has been invited for expert lectures and workshops at international and national platforms on cognitive behavior interventions, stress management, and personality studies and psychometric assessment. Her publications include research papers, articles, case studies, book chapters, reports, two edited books, and three authored books. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Professor Michelle and Professor Rachel. I hope I'm audible. I'm just trying to. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, faculty colleagues and dear students from both Salisbury University and Pandit Dindyal Petroleum University. I wish to express our gratitude to everyone for joining us today. I thank my co-panelists today, Professor James, Professor Askin, Professor Erin, Professor Kurana, and Professor Nigam Dave. On behalf of PDPU, uh, I convey thank to Salisbury University President, Dr. White, Director General PDPU, Professor S. Sundar Manoharan, Salisbury University Provost, Dr. Karen, Professor Tatin Shah, Registrar PDPU, Professor Nigam Dave, Director SLS, Professor Martin, Dean Salisbury University for the vision, leadership, and guidance in making this collaborative reality. This course was designed with an aim to achieve understanding about psychological theories pertaining to race, racism, prejudice, and discrimination and also to understand the potential and ethical obligation of psychology as a discipline to address these issues. As I mentioned during my opening speech, I firmly believe pre-colonial India was extensive, complex, regionally diverse system of faith and social identities that probably still has no parallel in the world history. But somehow, uh, most of the literatures which I was referring to, uh, which was available, uh, was comparing caste through religion and faith. Uh, we may need to understand this uh, relevance um, that to what extent we want to go ahead by every time comparing faith and caste. So that will be one inquiry which possibly we all need to uh, relook at. I also wanted to share this small story here which I'm sure all of us are aware, that is the elephant rope story, which is very popular with reference to explaining the belief system. So we know the short story as when these elephants are very young and much smaller, um, the, the small size rope is used to tie them. And at that age, it is enough to hold them. But as they grow older, um, they're conditioned to believe that they cannot break this. Uh, this belief that the rope will still hold them, uh, they continue to be tied up with this and they never break free, which is where I, I, I am trying to draw the parallel between how we see caste system currently, not just in India or US, but across the globe. Uh, caste system, when we specifically see from psychological theories perspective, um, I think uh, it is important that we need to see how this uh, social positioning uh, is connected and what is its impact? Because from psychological perspective, we need to understand and reflect on the fundamental question as to why do we need to even identify with the caste. From psychological viewpoint, identity is the key word of a society and a central focus of social psychological theories and research. The concept of identity carries the full weight of the need for a sense of who one is together with or often even overwhelming pace of change in surrounding uh, social context, changes in the group and network in which people and their identities are rooted and the societal structures and practices in which those networks are themselves rooted. So technically, when we try to look at this concept, <clears throat> I think it is also important to bring the element of um, interactionism of psychology, which we can take here in reference. The basic premises of any symbolic interaction 
is that uh, people attach symbolic meaning to behavior themselves and other people and they develop and transmit these meanings through interaction. But when we see uh, these identity uh, theories, um, over time there is a shift which has taken place. In fact, if we uh, see from psychological viewpoint, uh, we see problem with caste globally uh, with reference to a powerful social identity since members of uh, both the higher caste group as well as the scheduled uh, caste group, they frequently identify caste as a function uh, which give them a powerful social identity. Now, again, more important here is to see the impact on the identity process. So when we look at this, uh, we clearly see the impact is not just limited to uh, social orientation. Um, um, other panelists have already mentioned about its relevance and even in the book, it has been uh, very well uh, explained with reference to the political and economical uh, reference which have been drawn here. So from psychological research point of view, uh, the role of identity process in construction of caste identity, as well as inter-caste relation, it is important and also possibly uh, more research and empirical investigations are required in this direction. Uh, while I was understanding this concept from a social psychology perspective, I felt that it is also important that we see it from um, evolutionary psychology perspective. And that is why I have just um, kind of notified here about the gene culture core evolution, which uh, in human, it has been uh, uh, noted as uh, genes are the product of culture and uh, culture is a product of gene. So technically, when we talk about gene culture core evolution, uh, it is uh, understood that individual fitness in human will depend on the structure of total social life. So again, with this reference, we have to see that human cognitive, effective, moral, uh, all these capacities, they are the byproduct of this evolutionary dynamic and uh, this interaction between gene and culture. So further, um, I thought to uh, highlight again here about the religion because uh, as I said, that uh, something which worries me is uh, about to what extent and how far we will continue with this correlation of religion and casteism. I think now it has gone much beyond uh, religion. And uh, for centuries, it was believed that uh, it is all about uh, this uh, religion and specifically Hinduism was connected. But uh, technically, when we see um, 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 global history, we find even... Uh, uh, from the French as well as Russian Revolution, uh, all the references are with uh, uh, specific context to caste. So we have to actually uh, see this uh, in a more holistic view, uh, both from cost point of view as well as from impact point of view. Um, uh, further, I think uh, here, uh, this uh, social identity, I'm not trying to highlight upon uh, what can be done. I mean, what is uh, a way to see that we um, ensure it is not impacting further. So here we, we can possibly look at reversing the social identity theory. So according to social identity theory, group belonging and identification are natural to human, human being. This follows a worldview by which intergroup separation, antagonism, as well as cooperation. So caste and other social um, position here, which we are talking about with reference to identity, um, even foster group separation based uh, are on human stratification in a rational way. Now, reversing this logic uh, and suggesting that social identity theory may be founded on an inaccurate uh, assumption of social separation. I think that can be something interesting, which uh, um, I want uh, um, all the young researchers to look at. As uh, for uh, making such large scale social changes, again, uh, here we can take into consideration the cognitive dissonance which come into picture. So harnessing on cognitive dissonance, uh, we can challenge social separation on human ethics and with specific reference to the values. So I think uh, this uh, worldview, uh, when we talk about eliminating caste prejudice and encouraging individual in search of identity, uh, there are some uh, key takeaways for us, uh, especially from the Indian data or Indian researches. A uh, lot of efforts are already being done in terms of avoiding the pitfall of past. Um, even um, a lot of uh, unwritten code of conduct, which we can see in the new generation, is coming in in the positive direction. Um, 
we are also re-evaluating our circumstances, uh, what possibly must have led to acceptance of these ideas at that point of time versus how we see it uh, with specific reference uh, now. Um, having psychological interpretation uh, with caste, uh, I think uh, that there are a lot of uh, scope, both from uh, longitudinal research perspective, as well as from the way we want to identify its uh, future implication. Um, the book, which uh, has given a very interesting insight, uh, I, I, I strongly feel this morality uh, and the clarity regarding the same which has been mentioned uh, can be a very strong correlate which can be drawn uh, with parallel um, um, possibilities of research. Um, I will end here and uh, again thank everyone uh, on uh, helping us uh, see that we see it uh, in a more broader perspective, this topic, as I always believe in uh, today morning also, I was discussing it with Professor Nigandave, that it is such a sensitive topic uh, and high degree of sensibility is uh, what we all need to uh, take in viewpoint. Um, the only reason which I believe by high degree of sensibility is because of this uh, um, involvement of religion and faith, which uh, time and again is uh, involved in this whole uh, framework of understanding. Um, um, I congratulate all the students, uh, especially Professor M Michelle and Professor Rachel for successfully completing this course. Uh, also on behalf of PDPU and Salisbury University, I again uh, thank everyone, uh, all the stakeholders who have made this initiative both meaningful as well as um, a very rewarding experience for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, and thank you for um, all of our speakers. Uh, who have contributed their insights today and for everyone at um, SU and PDPU who have made uh, this course and the, the opening panel and the closing panel possible. Um, so now we wanted to open it up to questions to the panelists. Um, Dr. Ritu, I think you're still sharing your yeah. screen. There you go, thank you. Um, so there have been a few questions that stu that um, people have already posted in the chat. So we will just go ahead and start with the questions that have already been submitted. But if you you have questions, you can type them into the chat now, and um, we will try to ask our panelists to get to those as well. So the first question was directed to Dr. King, but I'm sure other people could answer this as well. Um, and it is, what type of action do you think is necessary and would help? Um, I, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Steele. I'll start, but obviously other folks can chime in. Um, I'm a teacher, so the first place I would like to see things uh, change visibly affected would be in terms of curriculum, in terms of uh, program, student life activities, uh, but curriculum especially, um, to steal from Peter Fish, it's the curriculum, stupid. Um, uh, if you have uh, curricular documents, you, you have a way, if you have a way to inspire students based upon things that are culturally relevant, if you have a way to, to engage students and, and almost trick them in the younger years uh, into learning uh, things that are critically important and that will be helpful to them in later years, then, then this will be a much easier process as they are, as they are older. Um, scriptures say something along the lines of train up a child when he was young, etc. Um, the other ways that action can actually take place would be for um, there to be a visible change, for there to be a palpable change in the way that our universities, our classrooms look. If, if there is a paucity of fact faculty of color, then make increased efforts to find quality Competent faculty of I think there's some connectivity issues. Oh, 
maybe I can pitch in a bit if it is permitted. Uh, as to how, you know, what type of action can, is necessary till the time Dr. King joins in. Uh, so I would want to share one uh, research that uh, Dr. Sharma and I did with uh, the slum people. And, you know, and the government made it compulsory for all the, for the ownership rights or the first uh, owner should, ha should be the woman of the house. You know, and therefore she automatically gets power and she automatically gets rights on the property. So one, economics, money matters a lot. So such changes definitely made the woman a property owner and therefore less of, uh, you know, uh, and all of these are below poverty line women, trust me, they are all like uh, Dalit uh, women, untouchables, name it, they are living in the slums and the government rehabilitated and gave them uh, possible spaces and good spaces to live where the Islamic already existed. We would love to share that research with all of you. So that is one step wherein a policy change can be made, uh, which is important. Secondly, uh, we need to have more heroes uh, and talk about, like Dr. King says, that uh, the curriculum needs to be restructured wherein more Dalit heroes, uh, more um, underprivileged heroes need to be, their stories need to be told. You know, these are all hidden stories. Not many people are there. Dr. King, if you want to continue, please do. I just question a bit and you know, wanted to share a few things but kindly continue i should not take your space oh no 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 i i was i was this happens at least twice during every uh, zoom course that i teach uh, my students uh plug your ears president white my students and i have turned it into a drinking game every time dr king disappears we must consume um at any rate, um, my, my point is, is that is that the places where actual change occurs at the at the at the most basic level in the home, beyond that in the classroom, beyond that in the in the legislative halls of state and 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 uh, federal governments. It's until we are affecting those places, until changes can be palpably observed in those places. In the border regions had recent uh, conversations with our provost, uh, a, a dear friend and a and, and a staunch supporter of of diversity and inclusion initiatives. But but one of the things that she offered up as a as a counter or as a, a an explanation to some of the slowness of progress taking place, for instance, with regard to an Africana studies major we're trying to establish here at the university was the pushback from the border regions. And that, that's the crease in my brow. Well, why is there pushback? Show me who those people are. Take me to the king. I'll go speak to that person. You know, I'll bring students. We'll go speak to that person. But just this constant notion of there's nothing that we can do because someone further up the line is rejecting or resisting it. There's got to come a point when that's no longer appropriate. Thank you. Do other people want to address the question of actions or do we want to move to another question? I think there was a, another question that actually tapped into this. Um, there was one about uh, thinking of action and just drawing on Dr. King's uh, comments about classrooms and curriculum of how teachers discourage discriminatory behavior. How can teachers discourage discriminatory behavior of students from dominant caste who come from families that strongly believe in and regularly uphold caste hierarchies. I'm wondering if, if Dr. Sudelberg or others might have thoughts on that, which seems very related. Yeah, I, I think this is very connected to Dr. King's comments just now. Um, we often talk about things like um, ethnic studies programs and you know, uh, diversifying curriculum, diversifying faculty as being, um, you know, really important and key to um, non-white students, Black, Indigenous students of color's experiences in schools. And that is, I think that is definitely true. Um, studies in uh, K-12 have shown that if, uh, if a Black student has a Black teacher in kindergarten through third grade, they are 13% more likely to go to college. Yeah. If they have two Black teachers in elementary school, they're 32% more likely to go to college. Come uh, on now. <laughs> but uh, but um, I think it's also important to recognize that those changes are also good for white students. Um, white students need student need teachers of color, faculty of color. White students need ethnic studies. They need history classes and literature classes that don't center 
white stories and the white experience. And they may be resistant at first to some of those changes because we are we white folks are so used to having our stories um, be centered in in the way that we learn in U.S. schools, but over time, I think um, those changes in curricula bene will benefit all and will help the dominant dominant caste stu uh, students and families um, to start to see the world differently to develop that radical empathy um, that Wilkerson writes about so beautifully. Go ahead, Dr. King. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Studeberg, for that. That's um, um, got me get that news over here. Um, the uh, one comment I wanted to make very quickly was that, um, I just had a senior moment, um, in relation to curriculum, in relation, oh, come back to me. I'm sorry, I lost it. <laughs> If there are other questions, go on. I lost my, my comment, forgive me. No, I, will, I can pitch in. So one thing that is very important is I have a problem when Wilkerson says that the, uh, the, the Indian uh, Dalit person who studied and was uh, getting education in US was doing first year of PhD, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, finds it difficult to talk to people who are certain, who are certain, or Guptas and all of this. We need to teach our students to be uh, self-aware, to be confident. And if you have education, education should lead you to light and not to more despair within, you know? So that is very important uh, example that uh, she has given. And for uh, the, the the black woman who doesn't tell uh, the plumber that she is the owner of the house, I mean, that is a problem again for me as to, it's okay. And then uh, the important thing is that she reaches out through empathy, you know, she reaches out through human contact. And that is what we need to tell our students to be human, to be empathetic to the other others' uh, situations and realities and experiences and not be judgmental or stereotype people because that is what most of the students end up doing thinking that they are the ones uh, because in india we have dalits who have become extremely powerful you know they are uh, uh, is officers or you know uh, major decision makers and uh, and one more thing that can be that can be taught to students is how to wield power when you are rich when you have power how do you treat the other it's very 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 important you know we keep killing uh, ravana every year uh, in our uh, religious festivals but he keeps coming back Evil keeps coming back, and we have to stop it within our hearts rather than anywhere else. That is something that is important. Empathy has to be the cure. Yes, Dr. King. I remember what I was going to say now. Charge it to my head, not my heart. Um, uh, Professor Studelberg and and folks in, in lower in the lower uh, working with lower working with the younglings. As very soon as you see behaviors happening that 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 flag in your in your socially conscious head and your progressive mind and spirit, call them out. You, you know how to speak to your own students. You you know you're not about suppressing. You're not about crushing students, but call that behavior out. When I have students in my classes at SU, and I have from the first day I was there until just this last Zoom meeting. Um, have students of the dominant culture refer to students of color, wait for it, as colored, right? Not with any malice, not with any intentional sort of bias implicit, but boy, you should see the black students, just brown students react to that. So get those moments, call them out in the same way. Be observant. You've got to be, you've got to be diligent, especially in the secondary classrooms for things like this when a when a black young student male or female sneezes watch and see who does or doesn't say god bless you and don't call that student out that doesn't say so but be aware of the fact that that is as about it that's about as subtle as you can get but i've had countless instances over the years at su of students specifically black female students comment on the fact that that occurs and that they're aware of it and it's something that can go past virtually everyone else in the room but it's having an effect on those young women and so to be attentive and attuned educators to be people that are part of the solution as opposed to the the, the problem have a sensibility for that and then find a way to, to, to genuinely, but but neutrally bring it. Did you guys notice what, what just happened there? You know, find a way to make it a conversation point. Again, not just for the sake of conversation, but ideally such that in the next class, when a student of color sneezes, 
everybody says God bless you. That's what I had forgotten before. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. King. That really gets to, I think the, what the person was asking was really, you know, how do you moderate behavior when you see good behavior or bad behavior? And I think that relates to Dr. Studelberger's talk about um, uh, K, through, K through 12 kids, but it definitely relates to the college environment too. Um, I think, you know, most of us that teach at the college level have probably either witnessed or had things happen in our classroom, both that were, were bad and needed to be called out, but, you know, maybe even things that were, that were positive that maybe needed to be highlighted, like, wow, you know, that was a, that was a really insightful comment, or thank you for, for mentioning that. So I think there are ways of kind of doing, highlighting, <laughs> highlighting the negative things and naming them and talking about mm -hmm. them. And making it something that we're not ashamed to talk about. We everybody everybody makes mistakes, but that we learn through realizing that and, and moving forward. So it is 10:05, and we are over our time. But there have been some comments about resources, and um, Dr. Nita. Um, sent us an email of her talk so we can share that with, with students, we can share that with the list of attendees. Um, other people mentioned, you know, are there resources, are there books? And so maybe, um, you know, if we get suggestions from people in the next few days, we can send out an email to everyone in the course and everyone who is on this call um, to share some resources for those of you who, who want to do more reading or thinking or thinking about ways um, that you can participate in action and make changes. We would like to, again, just thank all of our panelists today. Uh, I think everyone did an excellent job and it's very uh, great to see the inter-institutional uh, co and cross-cultural collaborations and linkages that we're able to make, um, as well as the interdisciplinary connections. Uh, we would also like to thank our attendees for uh, either getting up very early or staying very late to uh, participate in our activities today. And uh, also we would really like to thank the support of um, administration at both PDPU and Salisbury University for helping us form this collaboration and for um, facilitating uh, our efforts to make a really smooth course in a pretty compressed time. So um, in particular, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Paraboom at PDPU and SU respectively have been really instrumental in connecting everyone um, and helping us work. Uh, Dr. Egan has been uh, very facilitative behind the scenes in terms of helping us get advertising out, um, helping us run our, our tech in the background. And uh, I think he hopped off the call, but uh, President uh, Chuck White at Salisbury University um, has been a very supporter, a heavy supporter of our project. And so uh, we just would like to acknowledge and thank their assistance. Thank you. Uh, it truly takes a village to address these important issues and to identify meaningful action, and in this case, a global village. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day so or good evening. Thank you so much. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle and Rachel.